Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. Uh, this is Chris Scheich. I'm the EVP of sales here at Otimo. We're excited to have everyone join. Um, Otimo is a leading technology consulting company. We specialize in enabling organizations to accelerate their ability to innovate by taking advantage of modern technology. Today, we're presenting Cloud Native Continues to Live with Kubernetes. Uh, presented by Sam Brown and Gavin Mead. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please just type them into the question box in your GoToMeeting control panel, and we're going to address the questions at the end. Uh, without further ado, we will turn things over to Sam and Gavin. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Gavin Mead. I'm a container and cloud native evangelist with Otimo. I've been working exclusively with Kubernetes for the last year and a half, and in that time, I've worked to bring applications both large and small to Kubernetes. Um, another fun thing I like is extending Kubernetes through custom resource definitions and controllers, and most recently, uh, helping customers leverage Kubernetes for cloud-native continuous delivery. I'm really excited to speak with you all today. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Brown. I'm the practice lead at Otomo for Enterprise Cloud Native Solutions. I've been working as a consultant for 17 years and a continuous delivery specialist for about 10 years. I've worked as both a software engineer and an operations engineer, so naturally I gravitate towards Kubernetes uh, because of the advantages it brings to the entire software delivery process, which is what we'll be discussing today. All right. Today in this webinar, we're going to describe Otomo's architecture and framework that we use with our customers to help accelerate their adoption of containers and speed up their software delivery. Uh, we often help customers who are just starting their journey, but we've also worked with customers who have already started with containers but want to create more robust solutions around continuous delivery and Kubernetes. Um, the key things that we'd like for you to take away from today uh, as you're listening um, is our cloud-native CI-CD setup on Kubernetes, um, how you can do auto-scaling builds on top of Kubernetes, uh, shifting left quality and security, and we'll talk more about what that means, and then evolving towards GitOps, which is an emerging trend in uh, the software delivery space. Uh, so we'll talk more about that at the end. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a demo where you get to see all of this great stuff in action. So first off, a little bit of level setting. Uh, let's talk about what we mean when we, when we describe these terms. Uh, I think they're often overloaded, but uh, let's give them a little context. Um, first off, cloud native. Um, when we refer to that, we're talking about tooling and application architectures designed with cloud technologies in mind in order to enhance and or extend their capabilities. For continuous delivery, uh, when we're talking about continuous delivery, we're talking about the practice of automating the delivery of an application artifact through a software factory to a repository while ensuring consistency, quality, and security. And one thing I want to mention is that we're talking specifically about continuous delivery, which is delivering an artifact to a repository. Um, we're not talking about continuous deployment, um, which is often difficult in many client environments. Um, so one thing that most people can do consistently is at least deliver an application, and then we'll talk more about deployment strategies at the end. Uh, and then lastly, uh, when we're talking about Kubernetes here, um, and this is a very, very high-level overview of a very complex uh, piece of technology, um, but at the core, it's a cloud-agnostic container orchestration framework uh, built to efficiently run cloud-native workloads while remaining extensible for future needs and use cases. Um, and one of the reasons we look at Kubernetes is, is that it's good at automating many of the previous challenges we had at standing up application and tooling environments, um, but yet it stays extensible enough to run on any cloud provider and potentially on-premise if you want to. So it provides a lot of features and functionality uh, uh, that we're going to take advantage of here as we move forward in this presentation. So what are some of the challenges that we face in traditional CI, CD architectures and infrastructures? Um, as you see at the top of the screen, we've got a diagram with a bunch of tools that you may be familiar with. Uh, tools like Jenkins as a build server, Nexus as an artifact repository, and SonarCube for code quality metrics. And then in the middle there, we have um, traditional Jenkins build agents. So maybe we have a Java build agent for building Java applications, a Python build agent, and Selenium for running end-to-end -end tests. What you'll notice is that these are all um, virtual machines um, on their own. And so we have an entire virtual machine built to run just a single application in all of these instances. Um, so what we get is a, a very fixed infrastructure, right? We want to keep these things alive because we put time and energy into making them what they are. They become delicate and potentially fragile. You may have heard the term snowflake uh, servers. And so that's what we're left with. Um, 
Also, they often require uh, complex infrastructure automation. So if you're, if you're doing things in a repeatable way, which I hope that you are, um, to make sure that you can make these again or stand them up if you were to have a, a problem, um, tools like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, or Salt are often required to support these tools, um, to create them, to stand them up, potentially to upgrade them. And that requires a lot of investment and knowledge of, of your operations engineers or other engineers um, to stand up the tools. You have to know the tools themselves very intimately to know how to stand them up properly and manage and maintain them and potentially build in upgrade strategies into the tooling as well. So just maintaining a single, single tool can be very complex. And here you can see we've just got uh, just a little bit of that potential infrastructure needed to run your CI CD pipelines. Um, in addition to that, we often have, and I'm sure most people can relate uh, to underutilized or idle build agents where no builds are going on and yet we have to keep the, the virtual machines alive because um, it's expensive to stand them up. So waiting for a VM to stand up to do some build work uh, can be an expensive operation and adds to your build time, so we leave them idle, but they still have reserve resources so they can be ready to run. Um, that can also be cost prohibitive. Um, additionally, we come, we, we end up having a lot of uh, a matrix of build agent requirements across the organization. So um, things like one team needing Maven, where another may be, be Gradle, where another may need Python. Um, oftentimes, we somewhat smash all of these uh, toolings together onto a single VM or build agent, um, so that we can, you know, stamp it out and repeat it. Um, but that gets us stuck where. Maybe we can't upgrade Maven because that's got to go across all the build agents or we have to use infrastructure automation to update that. Um, so it can potentially require a lot of maintenance and a lot of, uh, a lot of investment in order to get the build agents you need to run your builds. Uh, and lastly, we've got, you know, you're running a full OS, as I mentioned, to run a single tool. Um, and so you get all the headaches associated with running a full OS, things like patching and all the associated security requirements just to run a single application like Jenkins can be a lot of overhead. Um, when you scale it out to all of these different tools. Um, then you get challenges in scalability, um, and not just in physical scalability, because you could clone these and, and make new ones, but oftentimes there's issues within organizations where the process can be prohibitive to scale, where we have to go to another team to ask for things, or maybe it wasn't in the budget uh, to be able to have that many build agents. We just didn't anticipate that we would need that. And so you may need scaling right now because your queue is stuck with build waiting to execute um, but we have no way to efficiently scale that up. Uh, we're often also left with point-to-point -point tool integrations and complex networking requirements. You may be familiar, familiar with uh, the port to Jenkins isn't open, or I'm not sure where Nexus lives, or Nexus got moved last week, what's its URL? Things like these challenges are really taking away from the time of actually executing builds and using these tools. Instead, we're, we're left troubleshooting instead of just utilizing the tools to their fullest. Um, I mentioned previously things like having upgrades in your tooling. Um, each tool has a little different upgrade strategy, and oftentimes that's built into the tool in different ways. So you may have to know the tool itself in order to upgrade it, potentially move volumes over um, if it has persistent workloads or things like that. Um, so upgrading tools can be very challenging. And then lastly, a, a big one that I think is often overlooked is you may not be extending your monitoring and log aggregation to these tools. Uh, monitoring log aggregation is usually um, on production workloads uh, because those are customer facing, right? Those are most important, those are business critical. Um, but just as important to getting your software out can be your CI CD stack. Um, and so, you know, if you've ever turned to a, a fellow developer and said, you know, hey, is, is Jenkins down today? Um, that means that you probably don't have proper monitoring or logging around your tool infrastructure. And that's a, a thing that you need in order to know how everything is operating and keep this up and running smoothly. So transitioning from that into kind of our view, um, as mentioned previously, we bring a framework of, of widely adopted open source tools uh, to create a cohesive build and hosting environment on top of Kubernetes. Uh, we start with Kubernetes as the foundation and then build on top of that with either our opinionated tool set or a mix of our tools along with tools customers may have already invested in. Um, we break this down into five areas, and, and what's more important is the capability and not necessarily the tool itself. Uh, so what you see in the white boxes is the actual capabilities that we need within a software factory. Uh, things like build management, code quality and analysis, uh, a software repository for storing your binary artifacts, um, your testing frameworks that you bring to bear to make sure you have quality, 
and then having continuous software compliance, which we'll talk about a little more. Um, there are different tools to fit in any of these boxes, and we have you know opinions on what we what we gravitate towards and what we know to work, which we'll show in a second. Um, but it's just important to make sure that you've covered all of these areas in any framework. And like we said, this is, this is a flexible framework that we can use um, either our tooling or, or tools that customers may already have. Um, we also take advantage of Kubernetes tooling functionality to bolster the security of the platform and add monitoring and log aggregation capabilities to provide a uniform experience for developers and operations engineers. Uh, as far as security, we're covering the platform, the application, and the network levels. Um, so we're adding security at all levels um, of development. We're also adding, as I mentioned before, things that are often lacking, which is monitoring of the tooling, both our production workloads, as well as our CI CD infrastructure, and then log aggregation to get out the information from this build tool. So you're not SSHing over to some Jenkins build agent to find out what went wrong or that a tool, you know, tool had an issue. Um, we're bringing all those logs forward so that we have a common place to look and triage when we're having issues with our, with our builds or our application artifacts. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like in practice. Uh, this is the physical architecture of our cloud native CI CD solution. Um, at the very bottom, what you'll see is uh, a scalable uh, compute cluster of Kubernetes nodes. Um, these are generally homogenized to be uh, very much the same um, so that you don't have a lot of management overhead in the types of operating systems that you're managing. Uh, often they are purpose built um, for running containers, uh, operating systems like CoreOS, um, you can use as your base nodes. And then what you get is a giant cluster of compute where, on which you can run any of the applications that you see above it. Um, this also makes things like maintenance very simple, um, where we may not even patch a node in place. We may take a node out of service, patch and, and deploy a new version of the OS without having to patch it. Um, and that's expected in the Kubernetes world where nodes are going to be com coming in and out of service um, and workloads are dynamic and fluid enough to shift around and Kubernetes manages the network on top of that to make sure that all of your applications are still accessible. In addition, we also have network attached storage like persistent disks uh, that we can attach to our tools to make sure uh, that they, if they do need to store things that that volume is always available whether or not the node that the application is on is available or not. So if an application or, or if a node goes down, the application can be moved to a new node, its volume is also moved and the application comes right back up, further reducing the, the operational burden on uh, the operations team. Um, if you move up a little to uh, what we call the management namespace, um, what you'll see is these namespaces are akin to either security networks that you're familiar with or uh, also environments. Um, and you can look at it in either way. Um, people segment their environments in different ways. Um, but we have namespaces um, here to segregate resources that Kubernetes provides to different tools. And then we bring together uh, things that work together into individual namespaces so that they can easily talk to each other. So in the management namespace, we have our CI CD tooling, we have Jenkins um, as our build tooling, SonarCube for code analytics, Nexus as our binary repository manager, and then Nexus IQ we use for uh, dependency security scans. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to shift left. Um, but all these tools work together to be our CI CD stack. Uh, and Jenkins, um, when it is using build workers, and we'll talk more about this in a second, is actually provisioning containers within Kubernetes to run this. And if it's not apparently, if it's not immediately clear from this, all of these tools are running as containers within Kubernetes. Kubernetes natively runs containerized workloads. Um, so all of these tools have been containerized. Uh, to the right of that, uh, we have the Selenium namespace, and you could potentially run Selenium with the CI CD tooling. This is just kind of a matter of choice. Um, but Selenium Hub controls how we distribute our end-to-end -end tests to the Selenium workers like Selenium Chrome or Selenium Firefox. Once again, horizontally scalable workers uh, to run our tests and scale up as workloads increase and then scale back down when they're not being used to free up underutilized resources. Um, and then on the far right, what might be a surprise is that we're also running our environments alongside all of the rest of our tooling. So we've got a, a dev namespace, which is akin to a dev environment, and then even a production namespace. And the production environment, while you may not necessarily think this is this is the best idea, um, there is network segregation, there is resource sandboxing. So all of the security is in place to be able to run this here. Um, we've also run production as a completely different cluster. And so that's completely up to choice in your security needs. Um, but there is built-in security into the Kubernetes architecture and the way that we put together this framework, which allows you to run all of this on a single cluster, which can further simplify the management of all of this tooling. 
Above that, you also see our namespace for monitoring, in which we have all of our monitoring and metrics tooling. Uh, we utilize Prometheus as our metrics collection engine. Um, Prometheus is great because it can monitor or, and get metrics at the node level, uh, the Kubernetes control plane level, and then also at the application level. Uh, and so we're getting, having cohesive uh, monitoring and metrics platform, which if you've been used to using any monitoring or metrics tooling um, where you've got different tools for monitoring your infrastructure versus monitoring your applications and you have to go to diff two different places and you can't get that single pane, pane of glass uh, to look across your infrastructure can be extremely frustrating. Um, so moving right just to the right, that's what Grafana provides. Grafana is built uh, is a, a dashboarding tool that is built on top of the Prometheus metrics where we can create real-time dashboards uh, to look into our infrastructure, including our CI-CD tooling. Next to that, we have Alert Manager, uh, which coordinates the alerting channels uh, to our various teams, and that is used in conjunction with Prometheus right off the metrics that Prometheus creates. So we can directly create alerts and then send those out via Alert Manager to the various teams. Lastly, on the very right, we have Fluent Bit, which is a log forwarder. Um, which takes loggings at the node and the container level, and then can send those logs out to either Splunk, Elasticsearch, or the log aggregation tool of your choice. Um, we don't have that pictured here because it is somewhat different depending on where we go, although we often use Elasticsearch as a managed service. Um, but that way we have all of our logs from all of our tools um, in one place. One second, I'm having momentary technical difficulties. All right, sorry about that. Uh, and then the last thing I'll highlight on the top left is uh, Nginx. Um, within Kubernetes, Nginx Ingress, or Ingress itself, is a specialized resource uh, which allows for uh, you to expose applications outside of the cluster. Uh, in a secure way, potentially. Uh, the way that we use Nginx, we use it in combination with uh, a tool called Cert Manager and another tool called External DNS, which allows us to specify the host and the, the TLS security that we want to apply to an endpoint and have that automatically created for us. For instance, in a cloud provider like Amazon, uh, the host name would be automatically created in Route 53 and a certificate would be automatically provisioned from the Let's Encrypt Certificate Authority, which is a free certificate authority, to bring back a certificate for our website and put that into Nginx as our reverse proxy to our tools or applications. Um, once again, as I said, this is actually all automatic in the background just by specifying these things within an ingress resource. Uh, and traditionally, if you've managed Nginx or, or any other reverse proxy, um, getting TLS, getting host name routing, um, and getting all the servers in the back end all correctly processed, and even when you have something like a fluid architecture like this, can be extremely difficult to manage. Um, and Kubernetes and some of the associated tools uh, provide flexibility uh, to allow that to happen more naturally and automatically, uh, which is why we take advantage of that. So moving on to the, the advantages, hopefully you've, you know, just from what I've described so far, you're seeing some of the advantages of that. Um, but some of the advantages of our cloud native CD solution, uh, first off, it removes the need for complex infrastructure automation to stand up or upgrade your tools. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, uh, things like these are great tools, um, but they often require a lot of built-in knowledge of both the tools themselves and also the tool you're trying to stand up to manage individual VMs. Um, and so we're removing the need for that and instead replacing it with a, a simple Kubernetes YAML manifest that declares what we want to have happen within the cluster. Um, we've estimated uh, from some of the work that we've done that you can get a cost savings of up to 75% because you're better utilizing the resource, your compute resources. Um, so we're able to pack more applications onto individual servers. So as, as opposed to having a single VM, one-to-one uh, -one relationship with an application, now we can have multiple applications, even sandbox within an individual VM and all running co-located, uh, saving a lot of money um, and a lot of compute resources. Uh, as I mentioned, built-in log aggregation, health monitoring, and restarts of unhealthy applications were traditionally only applied to things like production workloads because they were so critical to businesses. Um, but we would also argue that your CI-CD infrastructure is also critical and that it needs that same tooling. And using uh, the tools that we have in our framework, uh, it's much easier to get that as, as a part of uh, introducing the framework and all the monitoring aggregation tools that we talked about. Um, 
Using Kubernetes, you get automatic relocation of applications from unhealthy to healthy nodes, uh, including your persistent volume. So as far as management, if, if Jenkins or the node it was going on, running on was to go down, it can be automatically shifted to a healthy node, including the volume, um, and that's a hands-off operation, whereas before that was, you know, Jenkins is down, we need to go inspect and figure it out and potentially stand it up. Uh, service discovery for continuous delivery tools. Uh, so service discovery is a built-in feature of Kubernetes. Um, as I mentioned, it's very fluid, so you, all of your tooling could be moving around in the background, uh, but you can still have static endpoints where you know that your tools are going to be uh, so that you can always find them and they can always find each other more importantly. So that's an important part of, of using uh, Kubernetes to manage all of this. Um, I mentioned this briefly and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but we have on-demand build workers uh, that are scaled up extremely quickly, as quickly as a container can start up, which can often be under a second, um, and then disposed of as soon as it's done being used. So we, build, we scale them up for work and then we can get rid of them freeing up resources. And lastly, we have the freedom to create our purpose-built build agents. Uh, so if we want to have just a particular Gradle version to build a Java application, we can have a single build agent to do that. And so talking a little bit more about that, um, within uh, using the Kubernetes plugin within Jenkins, um, our build agents actually are part of a, what's known as a pod. Within Kubernetes, a pod can be one or more containers that share networking space and, uh, and volume, mount, you, volume mounts. So you're sharing the same uh, file space and they can see everything that each other can see. So every container can see the same files and volumes. Um, so now what we can do is we can make our tools and just put them in containers. So the tools are containers. So for example, if we wanted to have a build where we wanted to provision some infrastructure with Ansible, we could then have another Ruby container run server spec tests against it. And we could have those containers have individual tools within them, but be used together in the same build pipeline without having to put those tools into a single build agent uh, the way we used to have to with uh, virtual machines. Um, additionally, agents can be defined in line um, or as part of a Jenkins configuration, meaning that we can put them in the actual Jenkins file, which I'll talk about and show in a second, uh, which is a codification of our actual build pipeline. So we can actually define them in there, or we can put them in the initial Jenkins standup and have them already be there when we turn Jenkins on initially. Uh, I mentioned previously, agent lifetime is per build. So the agent is stood up, it's used, and then it's thrown away, um, which is good in a couple respects. Uh, one is short-lived, and two, that, um, that we can uh, have it very quickly stand up and then go away. Um, and then lastly, we have horizontal scaling of agents. Um, it's only limited by your cluster resources. So we can have our build scale um, and meet our queue demands as much as our cluster can scale. And then if we need more resources, for instance, if we're in the cloud, we could even scale up our cloud resources and give ourselves even more breathing room. So you get that elasticity to both scale up and scale down, making sure that you're making efficient use of your resources. So let's talk a little bit about what this looks like in practice as far as our continuous delivery workflow. Uh, I'm going to show you real quickly what this looks like just at a, at a visual level, and then I'll show you what it looks like in our Jenkins file as code. Um, so here we have a lot of standard, uh, standard stages in a build process. We have our checkout. We have our code build. Um, we're actually parallelizing our unit in integration testing as one uh, test stage. Uh, next, we have a compliance checking stage. We're running our code analysis dependency security analysis with Nexus IQ, uh, then we're building a local Docker image, and then we're scanning it with the Aqua Microscanner to ensure that it doesn't have any vulnerabilities. Um, if all of this has passed through successfully, gotten through our quality gates, then we're going to go ahead and push that Docker image to our registry uh, for later use, and then we'll get to the deployment aspects, which we'll talk about a little later. So as far as what this looks like in practice um, in our Jenkins file, um, Starting at the top, we have just some definitions of our project name, our app name, and the version that we're building. Um, but where it gets interesting is here where we specify the agents to do the builds. Um, we're telling the Kubernetes plugins to apply a label um, to our individual tools. And then we're saying which actual uh, containers we want to use. So as far as um, the actual containers that we're using, um, we have a kube control container, a Gradle container, a Nexus IQ, which is our dependency scanner, a Docker container for doing our Docker builds and Docker pushes. So now we have individual containers that are going to be used to do individual stages within our pipeline, which is obviously, which is a, a pipeline as code. So here we're starting with the pipeline uh, definition, we're defining our agents, 
We define some environment variables here, which is our encrypted credentials, so that we're not putting those directly into code. And then we start with our actual stages. And what you'll see is these match the stages uh, that were actually in that visual that you saw before. Uh, so here we're starting with the build. And what we're doing is we're actually specifying the Gradle container to do the build. So within the pod, we're saying which container we want to do this build step. Next, we move into test stage. Again, we're using Gradle for unit test. We're using Gradle for integration test. Moving on to compliance checking, Gradle for code analysis, but here we're going to use Nexus IQ for our dependency security analysis. Once again, we're able to use a purpose-built container to do the work that we want. Next, we're moving on to image analysis. We're building the container with Gradle, but then we're actually using Docker to build the container. Sorry, we're using Gradle to build a dynamic Docker file. Then we're using Docker to build the container. And lastly, we're going to use that Docker container one more time to want to run our Aqua micro scanner and scan for vulnerabilities. We'll then move on, and, and these are later stages, which we'll talk about in a second, but uh, pushing that Docker container if all this passes to the to a, to a registry, and then eventually getting to the deployment stages, which I, I don't want to steal Gavin's thunder. He's got a, a lot to show you in that area. So that's the continuous delivery workflow that we use. And now I want to talk a little bit about shifting left quality and security in those pipelines. Um, we use a very simple um, branching strategy, uh, which is proven to be very effective unless you have very complex needs, uh, wherein we do the majority of our development uh, for a feature in a feature branch. Uh, when that feature is complete, we will then merge it as a pull request or, or uh, create a pull request to request that to be merged into master, which is the code that actually gets deployed to environments. Um, but what we've done in our branches, including our feature branch, is to build in quality and security as stages in the pipeline that get executed on every developer commit uh, to the Git repository. So what I've highlighted is those stages that are involved in quality and security, things like unit testing, integration testing, code analysis, dependency security analysis, and container image scanning. Um, what you get here is if you've, you've ever been familiar with the process where um, security will come in um, at a later date in a project, they will ask for all the dependencies that are used in a project, so maybe all the Java libraries that are used, and they'll want to do a dependency scan to find out if there's any vulnerabilities there. Um, this can happen often weeks or months into a project, at which point many features are done, you may be relying on these libraries, and then it's found that you have security vulnerabilities in one of your libraries, or maybe, maybe even potentially many libraries, and when, then you go into remediation mode. Um, unfortunately, it's extremely disruptive to the team, and it's not always possible to remediate these problems very quickly. Uh, it may require a developer to go back into their work, figure out a new library to use, or maybe even just get a waiver. And also, these vulnerabilities have been running in your environment for quite some time before they were ever even scanned. Um, what we get by this methodology is that we're finding out in the feature branch the developers getting quick feedback um, that they may have an issue early um, and that they want to be able to um, remediate that now as opposed to later. So they get told that they are not matching policy, that a dependency they're using um, is violating policy. At that point, they can either ask for a waiver now or they can decide to use another library. But in either way, it's, it's less disruptive than finding that much later. And again, these quality gates are all run again at the pull request. When you request a pull request, the pipeline is run again with all of these quality gates once again. And then again, when master, when it's been accepted in the master branch, we're passing through them again. So you're getting a, a variety of quality. And by the time you've gotten to master branch, the developer has some confidence that this feature has passed all the quality gates and is now ready for deployment. And so moving into deployment, I'm going to uh, shift things over and let Gavin take over from there. All right, thanks, Sam. So I'm going to focus on how we bring all this together. And the biggest thing is, so you have this app and you have this image that, or app you want to build and you have an image that you've built, how do you take it to Kubernetes? And even the simplest application takes some effort. And so depending on your requirements, there could be a lot of Kubernetes manifests that you have to create. And I'm going to give kind of the 10,000 foot view of those capabilities and how you can leverage them for your apps. But like the icons that you're seeing there represent features of Kubernetes that can help make your application more uh, kind of cloud native from the get go. So like at a minimum, you probably want to have a Kubernetes deployment, which tells Kubernetes how many instances of your application you want running. If you're going to have more than one, that's going to necessitate a service. Um, and that's 
kind of think of it like a virtual load balancer within the container network. And this is akin to what Sam was talking about, where that becomes like a fixed IP within Kubernetes while your pods are shifting around all the time, or if you're adding or removing pods. If this application is going to be like say accessible from the internet or a corporate intranet, um, you may also want to take advantage of an ingress. And so that's where ingress rules come in. And as Sam showed earlier, we run um, an Nginx ingress controller. And ultimately what that does is it allows us to specify an ingress rule that says when you see this host, route to this particular Kubernetes service, and then that takes care of routing to your application. And then finally, depending upon the complexity of your app or any other needs you may have, you may take advantage of things like role-based access control, uh, pod auto-scaling. Auto That's a capability where you can, depending on operational conditions, you can scale up or scale down the number of pods within uh, your deployment. And so looking at this, even like a simple app, you know, there's a decent amount of work that goes into it. And it, depending upon the capabilities of your development teams, your release engineering teams, your infrastructure, you know, automation or uh, operations teams, this can seem a bit overwhelming. And in practice, like what we like to recommend is you find almost like lines of responsibility that each that play to the strengths of each engineering team. And even if your organization doesn't have these specific orgs, it still is a useful guide for how you can organize your project. So here's what this kind of set of responsibilities look like in a containerized world. You have really all the teams doing what they do best. Development teams, they should be writing code. They should write code, they should write test, push features. And their ultimate deliverable is a Docker file that can be used to build their application. Infrastructure engineering, their job is to manage Kubernetes clusters and maybe a little more interesting is provide the Kubernetes manifest for the apps that it's gonna be hosting. This creates a really interesting, like good bridge building between your infrastructure um, engineering teams and your development teams because it brings everyone to the table to figure out what this application needs uh, to run within Kubernetes. You then have your release engineering in the middle who are kind of like the glue um, for these two other engineering disciplines. Um, they provide the CI CD tooling like uh, Jenkins, Sonar Cube, Nexus, uh, basically everything in that management namespace. And then depending, if you already have a Kubernetes application being deployed, say through a CI CD pipeline, there's kind of an interesting, like kind of sea change that's happening within the industry. Like traditionally, and traditionally in Kubernetes speak is, you know, six months. When you were deploying an app, you would perhaps use something like uh, the Kubernetes command line tool, uh, kube control to update deployments. And the reason for this is because your development teams could be delivering updates at a pretty rapid pace. Cube control becomes really convenient because you can just say cube control update deployment and give it a new image. However, this process creates an issue. When your infrastructure engineers deliver the specifications for you, there was an initial image already provided. And every time you're running a cube control update, you're changing the image that was actually like deployed and now the cluster state is very different from what ops originally gave you. If you're ever in a situation where you have to do, say, a disaster recovery scenario, or say you have to recreate your namespace from scratch, if you run that original ops manifest, you're now running an older version of that app, unless ops is keeping track of those changes. That becomes really, really difficult. And it would be really nice if you could keep those Kubernetes manifests in sync with the latest Docker image that's being deployed. And that's really where the idea of GitOps comes in. GitOps really is just this, it's a really simple idea. It's the idea that Git is the source of truth for your cluster state. And it takes advantage of Kubernetes's core, I, I say one of its core principles, and that is what's the current state of my cluster? What is the desired state? How do I make them the same? And so what this means in practice is, if you declare that you want two pods of your application running, Kubernetes makes sure that two pods are running. So to do this, here's, what you, here's how this would look. Your Kubernetes manifests are stored in Git. 
Kubernetes manifests are declarative. You're telling it what you want, and then Kubernetes takes care of making that happen. So your operations engineers, they provide that in a manifest repo. Your developers, they'll push their code through to their application repo. That triggers a build. Jenkins takes care of, in that build pipeline, of building a Docker image and then pushing it to your Docker registry, or I should say container registry. Then what you have is a GitOps tooling, and I describe here as GitOps controller. What it's doing is it is pulling the container registry for image updates. And when it sees an update, it will take care of updating the deployment in the cluster and then updating the manifest and committing it to the Git repo so that everything is always in sync. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and do a demo showing all of this. So because CICD pipelines can look like paint drying, um, this was kind of pre-recorded and I'll fast forward. You'll see it move a little faster in some places. But here's what we have. We have our Jenkins server up. We have this uh, Jenkins job in place, which are OTMO loans. Um, we're using Blue Ocean just because it's a little easier to visualize what um, the build steps look like. So you can see here we have our master build and our last build was this uh, for OTMO loans was build 31. This is the same build pipeline that uh, Sam showed earlier. And then we also have um, to help level set. Here is a dev version of this application running. So you see this GoDev loans OTMO.com. It uh, also has an endpoint which will show called version. And what this does is this just shows what is the current container image version that's running for this app. So you can see it's Otimo, Otimo loans, uh, and then the version. Same thing for prod. We have go prod loans at otimox.com, and then the same thing, we have the version. Now you see here the version looks a little different. It's Otimo loans, the 0.1.31-master-gitops-prod. So the convention that we're using here is in our build file, we specify an initial image tag. And that convention is working off of an initial project version, which is like the 0 0.1. Dot .31 is the build number. Then we add the branch. And now when we're doing the GitOps part, we actually add that as a tag for the Docker image. And one really important thing is we're always building this. We only build the Docker image once. We're just tagging it a couple of times. And then here is our GitOps repo. So you can see here it's laid out for our two namespaces. We have a dev and a prod namespace. And if we we take a look, here are our specifications or manifests. We have a deployment.yaml ingress. And inside of this, the big thing I want to show you is we have the image. It's that same version, OTMO loaned 0.1.31-master. And then the same thing when we look in prod, we're going to see the same version, uh, master-gitops-prod. And the way this works with the tool that we're using, um, GitOps was um, provided, or the term came from a company called Weaveworks, and they wrote a tool called Flux that allows us to do this. And so Flux actually adds, we add some annotations that tell it when you see a Docker image that is basically tagged with gitops-prod, go ahead and automate the deployment of that image. Let's take a look at our cluster state. So here we're going to look at that management namespace and see all of the pods that we're currently running. So here you're going to see we're running Jenkins, we're running Nexus IQ, uh, Nexus for our image repository, um, and Sonar Queue for code analysis, and same thing with us, Selenium. We're going to take a look at the existing artifacts within our um, dev namespace. So we are going to look at the service, the pod, uh, the ingress, and the deployments inside of a namespace called Otimo Loans GitOps or dev-gitops. And so you see what we have here. We have our service, we have our pod, our ingress, and you see that ingress host points to go-dev. Um, and then deployment, we just have a replica of one. And again, there's the uh, service. One thing I left out in that command was the service account but we'll look at it here in, um, in the prod namespace. 
where we look at those same things. And when those manifests come up, you'll see um, the ingress rule points to go-prod, Loans at otmo.com, and then also you'll see you know the service account otmo dash uh, sa. And then the next thing that we look at is our actual yeah actually we're going to watch the um, I'm sorry the pods inside of our namespaces so we can actually see as we kick off the build we'll actually see these applications update as the build moves forward. And then lastly, in my bottom left-hand corner, basically we're gonna tail the logs for the Flux tool, which is our GitOps controller in this case. Um, and this will actually show how all of this comes together. So now I'm gonna go back into Jenkins and kick off a build. And so the next build number should be build 32. And as this kicks up, you see it's waiting for the run to start and waiting for the next available uh, executor. What's cool here is you'll see in a few seconds that inside of that management pod or management namespace, the build agent is going to spin up. It takes a few seconds because this depends upon if you're in a, if it is on a node where these images haven't been downloaded. But here you see the Otimo loans build. That is the build agent that was custom built for this project. So we see that the container is creating, and now it's running. Um, and now when we go back in to Jenkins, the build should be on its way. So as Sam mentioned, one of the nice things with Jenkins and some of the plugins that you have, like the organizations plugin, is it can scan projects, and depending on how you can configure it, you can have it watch one branch, you could have it watch feature branches, you could have it watch pull requests, and have it build all of these uh, branches anytime you want. If you set it up where you're doing um, like webhooks to push changes, anytime a new feature branch is committed, um, that can trigger a build. Because the idea here is that you want to provide fast feedback to your developers. So we go through the build, um, and basically every branch except master will go all the way up to the push Docker image to registry. It's only when we merge into master that that is our mechanism for moving forward um, in the uh, pipeline. Now you're gonna see the time is moving up and that's because um, I have some stuff to say but I don't know that I could talk for the whole lifetime of this uh, build. Um, but eventually what's gonna happen is gonna go through, you might see the UI change a few times and that's more of just a blue ocean thing. Um, but you can see here it's running the integration tests and unit tests in parallel and they're designed to be fail fast. So you can tell your Jenkins file, if one of these things fails, just fail the whole build. That way you're not waiting around till the end to see that a stage failed. Um, yeah, so this is where the UI gets kind of weird. But yeah, so now we're doing our compliance checking. So we're doing static code analysis, uh, dependency security analysis using Nexus IQ. And where this, you know, depending on your organization, you can decide how rigid you want to be with these tools. They can be nice and just give you kind of reports. They can also be a little more, um, I don't want to say disruptive, but if you fail a dependency security analysis, it will fail your build. Um, so now we're back in here, and now that's because we're pushing to the Docker registry. What's gonna happen is Flux, the way it works, is it's watching for changes. So one way where you have to change your thinking is that instead of this being a push model, it is a pull model for Flux. So with that, when you're doing your build pipelines, this you have to wait for Flux to find these changes. It has pretty good dials for how you can do that, um, I didn't want this to be too tight of a loop, um, but it wasn't tight enough, unfortunately. Um, but what you'll see here is Flux is eventually going to see that, oh, I, a new image has been pushed to the container registry, and then it's going to actually trigger an action. And I think that should happen in a moment. And the other thing, actually, you can see in the logs is it's looking at this Git repo. There we go. So this kicks in 
Flux sees, oh, here's a new version of my Docker image. And now if we look in the upper right, you see the dev version of the app actually deploying because it found a new version. It also updated Git with that image version. And what we can do once we validate, um, you know, if we had like smoke tests running, we see that this is our commit. I think it's 8CB43 is the uh, commit ID. We go back in here and we have a manual gate for deploying to prod. But here, if we look at our smoke test, what we do is we have a just a script that will curl that version endpoint and see what the version is. And we're expecting a certain one. So when I update dev, I see that it's the new version 0132-master. So let's also make sure that our cluster state matches what is in Git, because Git is supposed to be the source of truth for all this. When I look here, we actually see the commit. We flux auto-release Otimo loan 0.1.32.master, and we see the commit ID is that 8CB43. So they match up as would be expected. So this is a really powerful mechanism for keeping the cluster state in sync. We look at the deployment, and sure enough, the image is updated with the right, or that image section is updated with the right version. So everything is the way we expect it to be. So we're going to go ahead and deploy to prod. And it's the exact same process, really. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Because these are sync loops, depending on how luck, uh, I guess, treats you, um, it can sometimes take like the worst case scenario of your sync loop. So I'm going to fast forward this a little bit. Um, but the gist of it is it'll do the exact same thing, but it'll do it for prod. And the nice thing about this is because of those build tags, prod itself, you see, hasn't changed at all. And that's because when we do the deploy to production, all we're doing is tagging the original Docker image with that version master dash get ops dash prod. That's the effectively the build trigger. I'm afraid I'm going to go too fast. I'm going to go for it. Yeah, so now you can see that it picked it up. You see the new version in get the new commit ID, 78EB. Um, so now our prod uh, deployment is up and running. These are single um, replica deployments. We do have, like, if you're, you know, traditionally probably running like rolling updates with multiple, multiple replicas, so you can space out the deployment as you need to. Um, but it's the same behavior. Um, and then the build is successful, and we can go back in to the version, and we see that it's updated with the right version. Um, one thing you'll see when we go back into the terminal is that the build agent also terminated. So this is really great on the dev side, but how does this work now if you're an ops engineer and you need to do some work with your Kubernetes specs? Like, let's say, for example, your production app is seeing a lot of traffic and we need to scale up. Well. Git is the perfect tool for this because it gives you a log of everything that's ever happened with these files. So if I go into my deployment, I should be able to edit the number of replicas. Let's say I have one replica right now. I want to update it to two. So when I do that, it's really ops by like pull request. I'm going to go and I'll edit it inline in um, just in the browser. But what I'm doing is I'm going to submit this as a GitHub PR. So I'll create a new branch and then start a pull request. And, you know, in practice, you know, Sam's my boss in both the demo and in real life. He can look at this for reviewing and be like, yep, Gavin, this looks fine. He can approve it. So if you want to put quality gates, like I've used in GitHub or anything, you can look here. Um, he can look, see, here's the, the change that's being requested and they can approve it. And since this is a demo, I'm just going to go ahead and merge it. So now I'm merging this change into master. And now Git does the other thing. It's going to make sure that it's going to look at Git to see what the current cluster state should be, pull in the new branch, and give that to Kubernetes to take care of rolling the deployment. I'm going to fast forward again because I 
the demo gods were always I was always at the tail end. Um, let's see. There we go. So you see here, we are now scaling up. We're adding a second instance of our Otimo loans pod, and that's because we updated our deployment to have replicas of two. That makes us happy. Um, I'm going to go real fast here because I can get it in before the dev loop or the sync loop happens. I'm going to go back and change it back to one. Say it was like, oh, there's a false alarm. We don't need to scale up. Let's go ahead and just put it back to normal. It's the exact same process. And what's great because this is Git, you have an audit log of everything that's ever happened with this file. And in practice, also being able to see um, if you have to recover your cluster, you're always recovering it to the state it was in. So now if I go back in, I think I did it fast enough. I'm going to fast forward anyway. No, we got 30 seconds. It's okay. Um, but it'll be the exact same process where we do the sync and we will end up terminating one of the nodes so that we're, or pods so that we're back in the expected state. So GitOps is a really cool technique and um, it's still an evolving technique, um, but I have found it to be a really great way to, you know, like Sam mentioned, VMs can be snowflakes. Um, you don't want your Kubernetes clusters to be snowflakes either. This becomes a really easy way to recover them. And so with that, that concludes the demo. And, you know, the last kind of thing before we go to the Q&A is, you know, everything you, you saw with this webinar is the result of iteration. You know, we've shown a lot from running your CI CD stack on Kubernetes to giving continuous feedback to your developers for quality um, to GitOps. And so when you start something like this, it's okay to start small. You know, it's okay, like identify like a pilot application, go through the process, find what works for you as an organization, um, and then gradually add more applications. If this is like, you know, crazy, and you just want to get into like, say Jenkins, like start with Jenkins files, and if that's brand new to you, that's great. Iterate on them, start with the build steps, and start building to the right as you need to. Um, You'll always be iterating through this process. And uh, you know, we thank you for your time. Um, and you know, I'll hand it back over to Chris. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Gavin. Um, we'll switch gears now and do some Q&A. Uh, so some folks have already submitted a few questions. Uh, it's not too late. If you have some questions, again, just submit them in the GoToMeeting control panel. Uh, so one of the questions that came through was, what if a certain tool that we use uh, in our CI/CD process isn't containerized? So if it's not containerized, uh, you certainly have the potential to keep it outside of the cluster and then contact it from within the cluster. So it, it's, not, it's not always possible for every application to be containerized. In most instances it is. And so we would definitely, if we were to, to work on it, take a hard look at whether or not we could put it in a container or not. But even if it's not, um, it's still possible to connect to external tools. So Kubernetes is just a way to run applications easily, um, as we've shown, hopefully, that they're they're easier to run in that methodology than necessarily in VMs. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't run in a, in a somewhat hybrid infrastructure. Okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, we've got probably time for one or two more quick ones. Uh, how safe is it to run the production environment on the same cluster as the dev environment, et cetera? So that completely depends on the security controls that you want to use. Um, there are security controls that you can implement in Kubernetes, and then there are also additional security providers out there, um, Aqua, TwistLock, Anchor, um, a few others um, that can provide additional security enhancements. Um, you can have many of the same controls in, within Kubernetes that you would have in, in a standard infrastructure, things like network policy and control, um, and controlling things at the Docker container level, things like SE Linux are still available, set comp profiles. Um, so it's, it's all about the same rigor that you would apply to your normal infrastructure can still be applied within Kubernetes. Um, and so it's, it's what you're willing to you know, your security, working with your security team to demonstrate to them that the security controls you put in place for Kubernetes are the same that you would have in any other infrastructure. The Kubernetes is really no different um, and that you can do those same things. Okay, great. Um, 
do you recommend uh, any tools to create a cluster in any given cloud provider? Uh, so depending on the cloud provider, I mean, if their offerings make sense, um, it, it's definitely good to start from the managed services. So if it's, you know, if you're in Azure, go ahead and use um, AKS. If you're in uh, AWS, use AKS. And if you're in Google, use Google Cloud. I mean, because that the barrier to entry then is a lot smaller um, and you are letting your cloud providers manage the services for you. Um, one thing just to keep in mind is when you take that route, just make sure that apps you bring in um, have can leverage the capabilities and if you have to make custom changes to say the Kubernetes control plane, not it still um, can be challenging to update those as like you would need to. So like say if you need to add like custom admission controllers or other things, that can be a, uh, that's just something you want to be aware of instead of rolling your own. And then as far as the, the tools that we like to use, um, we've definitely used COPS quite a bit in the past. If we're on AWS, we've had a lot of success with COPS. Um, you know, there's, it's yet another tool to learn, but it's effective in keeping cluster state um, in S3 to match your cluster itself and roll changes out. It uses Terraform behind the scenes. Um, so that's definitely a tool we've had a lot of success with. So if, if you're looking beyond the managed services, COPS is a great tool for, for at least AWS, and I believe it works in Google Cloud as well. Okay, great. Uh, will Otimo sell the system as a service off the shelf or through in-person consulting with clients? So it's actually both. Uh, so we have a pre-configured framework that we can install uh, pretty much out of the box um, with no changes, or there is a custom solution as well that it can be altered depending on your uh, you know, environment, uh, variables, and needs from a development standpoint. So we've got one minute left. Um, we want to just thank everyone for their time. Uh, thanks, Sam. Thanks, Gavin. Really appreciate all the information. Uh, if you have any further questions, by all means, please feel free to reach out. Uh, you can reach us directly at my email, chris at otimo.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at otimo.com. Uh, really appreciate any feedback that you want to provide, or even if you want to suggest a topic for the next webinar. Uh, we'd love to have those requests as well. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.